Welcome into the PFF NFL podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. It's playoff time, Sam. It is Straight playoff time. It. Straight in. Wild I'm card it. round. We got four games to preview, so we'll give them all a little bit of love so we don't have to go rapid fire. No rapid for fire one. for this one. You think no. we can keep it tight enough to do four games in a podcast? Can we keep it within an hour? I don't know. You're a little long-winded. Right. You don't exactly help the process. We, we, don't fe- we, uh, we don't work well together when it comes to keeping no. it We spiral you know, out of control. Short. But I think people like that sometimes. Maybe they do. At it's least endearing. I'm going to roll with that until, you know. The YouTube people think we hate each other. Well, you know, you catch us on the right day and maybe they have a point. Maybe they do. <laughs> All right, let's get into this weekend's action. Um, two games Saturday. Uh, we've got the Indianapolis Colts at the Houston Texans to kick off all of the playoff fun. That is the first game, right? Uh, I don't even know what order they're in, actually. You sure. Look? Yeah, I'm let's pretty go sure with that. that is. I'm pretty sure that is. That's what we're starting with. Colts and Texans. I haven't planned out my weekend yet and my, uh, how I'm watching these games. Um, third time they've played. So you were talking about this whole... I mean, you were talking about a team that's already won two. These teams have split. The road teams won both games. But the third matchup for the Texans and Colts this year, that always brings an interesting dynamic to the, uh, to the matchup. Yeah, and they're also tied in terms of points over the two games. So they've each been three, you know, three-point win. And tied in team. points against. Yeah, yes, mm-hmm. exactly. So right. essentially they're even, dead even right now, having taken one game to overtime, the road team having won both the encounters, and yeah, points for and against, therefore, are entirely evenly split. Um, this is, I think, a fascinating game for two reasons. One, because the Colts are still riding this hot streak. Andrew Luck's been really good. The Colts generally have been really good over the back end of the season. They've overcome, you know, one of the worst deficits in NFL history to still make the postseason. Um, and on the flip side of that, you've got the Houston Texans, who I have been expecting to be found out all the way through the season. Maybe this is where it happens. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Maybe this is it. This is one of those tests of uh, the quote-unquote momentum, right? You know, the Colts are supposed... I mean, both teams are kind of riding pretty good momentum down the stretch, if you believe in such things, playing well down the stretch. Uh, The Texans did lose to the Eagles a couple weeks ago, but um, I'm interested, of course, in the quarterback matchup when you talk about the future of the AFC. And I know Andrew Luck's in, what, year seven, but, you know, that's, that's not... It's not like he's getting old or anything. He's got <laughs> 10 more years of quarterback play, assuming he stays healthy again. So we're talking about Andrew Luck a developing Deshaun Watson in the AFC South. We already know about Patrick Mahomes, Baker Mayfield. I think the AFC is going to have some really unbelievable playoff matches, uh, playoff matchups over the next few years with these quarterbacks. So uh, let's start with Luck and the way things have changed for him this year. New system. New scheme for the first time. And I'm going to go, go back again to what uh, Zach Robinson likes to, the way he likes to, just, just to describe Andrew Luck. He's so good at progression passing and kind of the complicated aspects of quarterbacking that his entire career, whether it was Bruce Arians, whether it was Rob Chazinski, whoever's, uh, you know, his offensive coordinator gives him difficult things to do. It's deeper drops, it's survey the field, and he always held the ball a little bit longer. But that was okay because he made special plays down the field. This is the first time, though, Frank Reich trying to get the ball out of his hands. He had 331 throws that uh, lasted less than two and a half seconds, which is kind of like our cutoff. Is it a quick pass? Is it a longer developing pass? That's by far the most of his career. And he saw the lowest pressure rate of his career by 9%. It's a whole new offense for the Colts this year. Yeah, the entire Colts offense used to be essentially Andrew Luck can make it happen. You know, if we just let him play give him a deep drop back, ask him to find a guy, he'll do it. And right. that's all we're going to rely on, which was fine, only it really exposed him to hits. Uh, it made life difficult for him because it was all on his shoulders. There was nobody that was sort of as fundamental to the functioning of an offense as Andrew Luck was to this Colts offense. And it ended up getting him broken, essentially, just subjected him to too many hits, too much punishment um, by trying to, to eke out all the time he had and find a guy and, and take a hit at the end of it. This season, I think, has been big for his future because it's completely reversed that. They've tried to take, get the ball out of his hands quicker. They've tried to kind of help him out with the scheme as well as letting him do some of the complicated stuff. And it means he takes less hits now. So he's not subjected to the same level of abuse and physical uh, toil that he was over the past few seasons. And that has to be good for extending his career long term and letting him play and we've seen that 
you know, if you're able to do all the complicated, difficult stuff like he has been, then of course you're going to be able to do the easy stuff as well. And, you know, when you let, when you actually focus the offense on giving him more of those, you get kind of the best version of Andrew Luck. He's still able to make some special plays every now and again. Um, in particular, where you see those kind of late fourth quarter comebacks, but he's also able to play at just a higher level down to down because you're giving him an easier job. Yeah, he always had a high percentage of turnover worthy plays, which was the complete opposite of what I expected coming out of Stanford. I thought you were going to see a Peyton Brady type of player who would be good in the quick game, five step game, and then yeah, he could make those special plays when needed. Instead, it was closer to a Brett Favre, high volatile type of game that Luck played for years. So um, I do think he's settling back in as a more efficient quarterback. He still makes some bad decisions in there. He still had a high number of turnover-worthy plays, but not like what he did years ago. Um, so I do think that's you know one of the keys. And, and then when you look at the offensive line, um, they don't get all of the credit for Andrew Luck facing 9% less pressure, but they do get some of it. It's yeah. definitely a hybrid effort. Anthony Costanzo, Quentin Nelson. So look, the two rookies, Quentin Nelson at left guard, he was the number six guard in the entire NFL. And then rookie right tackle, Braden Smith, the number 27 offensive tackle in the NFL, which is good. There's 60 in the top stars. half. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Anthony Costanzo. So those two rookies have been fantastic. Costanzo is the number 17 offensive tackle. So you have three fifths of the offensive line in the, in the top 32, so to speak. Um, so they've improved quite a bit. They've been helped a little bit by the scheme in the quick passing game, but um, improvement across the board for the Colts has really made that offense tick. Eric Ebron's breakout season, of course, too. Um, so a lot of good things happening for the Colts on the offensive side. Yeah, and, and critically, Braden Smith played well when he faced Houston before. So it, he faced him twice, but he only played four snaps the first time because he wasn't a starter yet. Uh, when he played them the second time, he gave up a sack, so that's not good, but that was the only pressure he gave up in that entire game. So right. one sack and nothing else going up against that Houston defensive line is actually a really good return for a rookie in particular, right tackle. So yep. you know, normally you would be heading into this game saying, well, okay, this guy's played pretty well, but he's going up against one of the best defensive fronts in the game. That's an, an area of weakness or a potential area to be exploited, but at least from what we've seen so far, He's up to it. And, you know, it's still going to be a challenge with J.J. Watt, right. Jadavian, Clowney. Uh, Clowney, uh, I think I made the – I don't know if it was here, but I made the comp of JPP for Clowney yeah. in recent um, – somewhere in recent weeks. Maybe a touch better than JPP based off the grading, but JPP at his best was an elite run defender and a good, not great pass rusher. I think that's what Clowney has settled in as so far. I know he's battled injuries and all that stuff, but – there's never even there's never been a time where you're like, oh, Clowney's a top three pass rusher. Yeah, but he's very good, and Watt has gotten back to that uh, elite level. Well, he's at the elite level. He's not at JJ Watt elite level where he was unstoppable and he was in Aaron Donald territory early in his career. But we had him as first team All Pro because of his pass rushing, uh, 75 pressures this year. So those guys as a tandem uh, really give the Texans a chance. Yeah, I think Clowney has developed into the best run defending edge rusher in the nfl um calais campbell's gonna yeah, gonna send you a dm on i, that I think one. the other thing is he's he's kind of become this michael bennett style player where actually where he's at his best is probably working inside where he's use he uses that sort of physical um freak ability and quickness to get in uh, inside of tackles inside of uh, bigger slower offensive linemen right he doesn't really have the speed to kind of turn the edge the way you know truly elite speed rushers can at the NFL level when you move those guys inside and they're still strong enough to get that done you know Michael Bennett with his little children's shoulder pads and his <laughs> quickness has always exposed those guards and tackles inside and again it's not always not necessarily as a pass rusher he's just able to shoot those gaps and destroy plays in the run game and that's kind of what Clowney does, is he's still so strong inside. He's more than able to hold up against those guys. And his quickness, just the ability to shoot those gaps and come at them in a, a different speed that they're expecting, is how he's so devastating as a, a run defender um, working from inside. I think that's kind of where he's at his best. JPP, I think, is a good comp um, for the reasons he said. He's a better run defender than pass rusher. But I think Michael Bennett is another one as well in terms of kind of usage and how they – make their best plays yeah and then the 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 biggest story i think for the texans on defense what when we when we came into the season we said look the texans and we'll talk about their offense in a minute 
they're weak in the wrong places because the secondary has massive question marks. Yeah, they've got, you know, if Watt gets back to it and Clowney's back to it and Merciless gets back to it, our preseason analysis was like, yeah, sure, they could have a good defensive line, but what about that secondary? They're getting um, an almost career year from Kareem Jackson. He's had a fascinating career if you just look at PFF grades. There's a whole bunch of average in there, but there's one excellent season in 2014, a very good season in 2012, and now randomly a very good season in 2018. Yeah. For Kareem Jackson, who started the year at safety and has played more corner, allowed a pass rating of only 75 into his coverage, 10 pass breakups. So Kareem Jackson playing well. Rookie Justin Reed playing well. He makes our all-rookie team as our uh, flex defensive player. Jonathan Joseph, when he's been out there this year, has been uh, pretty solid as well. So this secondary in back seven, Tyron Matthew, all these guys that have you know came in with question marks, they've been solid and essentially... You know, I think been one of the keys to the Texan success. I think both these defenses <clears throat> are playing at a level; uh, they're outperforming the talent level, but for different reasons. Um, I think the Texans are kind of scheming up a lot of relatively creative and exotic things on the back end. It's enabling these guys to have uh, to outperform their, the level you would expect from them. Like you said, there's a a whole ton of guys that are either having career years or just playing extremely well. Matthew, Kareem Jackson, Jonathan Joseph. Um, you know, bit part players in the secondary as well. And then the linebackers, McKinney, Zach Cunningham, these guys have been playing well. Cunningham's really come on the second half of the year for right. sure. And then the Colts are doing almost the exact opposite. They're basically creating almost the most vanilla scheme you could possibly come up with on the basis that if you eliminate all the thought process and just say, right, this is what you're doing every single play, do it at 100 miles an hour, and more often than not, things will go well. Like they've been doing that, and it's having the same kind of effect that these. Guys, you know, everybody knows about um, Darius Leonard, obviously, who's had a great rookie season, but they're still getting good play out of their defensive front. You know, the Margus Hunt thing that seemed like it could easily be a fluke last year. He's still been playing well. Like, he maybe hasn't been as good as he was a year ago, but Margus Hunt, uh, Danico Autry, Jabal Sheard is still very good. You know, their front has been playing well. Leonard at linebacker, and then those group of defensive backs, Pierre Desir has had a really good season for them. So I think you're seeing essentially the same thing, that two defenses that on paper have plenty of holes and plenty of questionable talent are dramatically outperforming that because of the coaching jobs, just in completely different styles. Yeah, I'm trying to... I screwed up. I'm trying to filter, oh, yeah. but they've got the most cover two snaps of any team right. in the NFL as the um, cover two is not really a thing anymore. Um, it is funny, again, talking to Zach, who does watch every single snap. Actually, the Texans are right up there with the Colts in cover two snaps now as a percentage. He was talking about how teams were creatively getting to cover two, and I, I don't know if he was just talking about the Rams or not, but it is. there has been a big cat-and-mouse game with offenses and defenses, I think, in the second half of the season. But uh, regardless, the Colts play a lot of cover two, cover three, a lot of zone-heavy schemes where, um, you know, in today's NFL, when teams are trying to throw the ball short you know soft zones are generally conducive to that but if you have the right playmakers you can limit big plays and you have a guy like Darius Leonard in the middle making a ton of big plays for them at linebacker I mean he's going to be a key for this as well yeah absolutely I I think both these teams have been fascinating to watch because of the fact that those schemes are actually having such an impact on the defense what really intrigues me about this game is this idea of the Houston offense though it's Deshaun Watson and New Hopkins and nothing else. That should not be good enough to win games and perform well consistently as an offense. And yet it has been all through the season. Um, it, it's kind of amazing to watch and it's hard to identify exactly why that's been so successful. Obviously, the two players in question are really good. So that's so, part of it. Just so you know, so from a PFF grade standpoint, New Hopkins, by far the highest grade on the Texans offense, 92.5. Deshaun Watson's number two at 82.6. Uh, number three is Will Fuller, who has, is injured and only played 375 right. snaps. And then number four is Lamar Miller at 74.6. He's a running back. You know, who cares? Um, beyond that, everybody's in the 60s or lower. Right. So you got... And two, the offensive line is very low. Two pretty elite guys. Everyone else in the 60s or worse. Yes. Um, and that includes Julian Davenport, the starting left tackle at 52.9. Yeah. Martinez Rankin, who's you know played 430 snaps on the O line at 42, and that's been the story. This O line grades horribly, and Watson has faced the most pressure in the NFL. Some of it on his own, but they've still managed to be productive on offense. 
Right. It's kind of ridiculous. Obviously, the fact that those two are very good is part of the reason it's been successful. But even given that, it should be possible to slow down one connection when that's all you have, particularly when the offensive line is that bad. I think uh, Deshaun Watson's ability to move around, scramble, evade pressure, etc., makes it harder still because, you know, you don't just have to deal with covering New Hopkins. You have to deal with when things break down and, you know, the scramble drill starts and you have to adjust and all that kind of thing because Deshaun Watson can take off and make plays in the backfield and running. It's, it's, it's a lot more to deal with as a defense. So that's part of the issue. But this new Hopkins season has been ridiculous. Yeah, really he has. He has 159 targets this season, which actually isn't even close to his highest targeted seasons. Like, he's been up, I think, 200 at one point. Yep. Uh, 115 receptions, so that's catching 72.3% of his targets. No drops. That's the highest total we've ever seen over a season with no drops whatsoever. And it's not like these are all routine catches. Like, despite the fact that he has no drops, we have multiple freaky one-handed catches in there. Like, these have been high-level difficulty catches that he's been bringing in despite not dropping anything. Yeah, it really has been um, an exceptional year. Highest grade we've given since 2006, tied for the highest grade, right? Um, And then I'm looking at uh, Watson's breakdown here. He has a bunch of games over 70-plus. Those are your solid grades. A few in the 50s and 60s and two disastrous games in there. So he's an 82.6 overall. But and I hate I hate to do this if you take out two games, but just for the sake of argument, if you take out two games, he's he's a high eighties quarterback, which puts him in the top eight, top seven or eight, right? Um, so if you're getting that level of play from Watson uh, behind a bad offensive line and with only Nuke to throw to and a revolving door of uh, other guys, first off, I think the future for the Texans looks really good if that's the case because this offense has to get better talent wise. But secondly, this is why I think it's going to be a great matchup. Watson can take over a game. Luck is our t- number three quarterback. He could take over a game. This is going to be a shootout. Yeah, in theory. Um, and it's also it's, it's interesting because with Cole's defense, the thing that's making them successful is that they have been playing this relatively idiot-proof system that doesn't require thinking or adjustment or any, any of this kind of stuff. But given that the, Col- uh, the Texans are basically just Watson to nuke, the game plan playing them should theoretically be to double nuke every single play and force him to beat you with somebody else, anybody else. doesn't matter. Just take him away, right? right? It's not that hard to do. We've seen the Patriots, you know, dedicate themselves to stopping one specific player on an offense. It's very possible. Now, nuke will make some plays anyway because he's that mm-hmm. kind of freak, but you can dramatically limit the opportunities he has to make plays but in order to do that you have to go away from your vanilla cookie cutter system that just lets you line up and play you actually have to change things around and insert some specific things that require thinking and communication and all that kind of stuff so you would feel that the colts probably don't want to do that they just want to ride the horse that brought them there probably which is playing into the texans game plan because all they have is watson to the Hopkins. They'll still probably be forcing him uh, the football. A couple other interesting Watson numbers too. 60 scrambles. That's times he dropped back to pass and then took off to run. Yep. That ties Michael Vick for the most in the PFF era. Um, so that was that's a huge part of the game. And all of the numbers when he throws the ball outside the, the, the pocket, five touchdowns and a ton of yards. I mean, he's in the top two or three in the NFL. So he is one of those quarterbacks. Um, and again, talking to Zach about what he was doing at Clemson. He was a lot of like one read and take off. Yeah. But this is one read, two reads, and then make a play. This is different. Yeah. And that has made him really, because when you give him one read to throw the ball, he's very good. But now his ability to extend plays, while he always had it in him, he didn't always show it at Clemson, and that's made him really dangerous. But the other thing is his play under pressure has, or at least his his play under pressure has been... I would say unsustainably productive, only he's been sustaining it for a hell of a long time now. So You know know what is unsustainable? All right. So look, when you look at Watson from a two-year perspective, his stats are exceptional. Last year, we were sitting there saying he hasn't played as well as the stats show. This year would still be the case. His PFF grades lower than the stats would indicate. I think just the drop rate. He led the league in drop rate for the second straight year. 
Yeah. That is an uncontrollable thing. Of course, you've got Hopkins, right? right? Padding that. Zero drops from 170-odd targets, So I know I said it was. And I, I know hate, people hate when we do this, but if you just give him a league average drop rate over the last two years, which is something he can't control, his passer rating probably drops 8 or 10 points. So he hasn't played as well as the stats have showed. But the under pressure numbers, yeah, eighty-eight point two passer rating is also something that could. Come so out. that's the number two passer rating in the NFL behind only Nick Foles, who obviously hasn't had long enough to right. for that to come down. You know, that's I think that one is a product of volatility and short sample sizes. Deshaun Watson at eighty-eight point two, despite being the number one pressured quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, like those things should not intersect. The guy that is pressured the most in the NFL should not have the highest. Uh, passer rating when pressured. For example, the guy that's number two in terms of pressure is Josh Allen, and his passer rating when pressured is 47, which is oh, that went up. like almost dead last. That went up over the last couple of weeks. Right. But the point is, <laughs> the guys that are at the top of the pressured list should not have the highest passer rating. Right. So Josh Rosen is number four. His passer rating is 38. Those guys should not be good at this, but Deshaun Watson seems to be consistently able to do it. He... I'm sure there's there's a degree to which this will come down to earth a little bit for no other reason than the PFF grade isn't as good. So again, when when the grades and the numbers don't match up, typically the numbers will come back down right. to the grade at some point. So I would suspect his his play under pressure comes back down to earth a little bit long term. But at least for the moment, he's able to do it at an incredibly high rate. And a little bit like Russell Wilson, he's kind of at home when he's playing this sandlot ad-libbing just make something happen game right like a lot of quarterbacks that would just be a death sentence to have there like can you imagine kirk cousins having to play that way he said right kurt drop back no. there'll be a pressure pretty immediately run around make something happen like it would just be game over well, this is done but this is the danger do you really want to pressure or do you want to play contain and i think you have to mix that up because he will take sacks too right but I for mean, wilson a lot of and watson i think they're kind of at home playing that game and able to get really good results doing it. Yeah, and the one final number I'll show, I tweeted out yesterday, the most sacks charged directly to the quarterback. It's Dak Prescott with 15. We'll talk about him in a minute. Deshaun Watson with 14. It's actually all playoff quarterbacks other than Josh Rosen. But so that's 14 times that Watson either left a clean pocket and got sacked or he dropped back too far and his you know linemen were blocking for a different pocket and he, they lost leverage or he stepped up into a sack um, so that's kind of the risk reward when you're coming after Deshaun Watson. You'll get some negative plays in there uh, if you if you if you're looking for him, but he'll burn you, you know, behind the behind the coverage as well. So um, I think it's a fascinating matchup, even though we've already seen it twice. You know, Watson in luck on the big stage. It's Watson's first playoff game. I think I just think we're in for a very fun NFL over the next few years with all these young quarterbacks. Where, where are you leaning on uh, in this one? I'm gonna go with the Colts. I'm gonna ride the hot hand and I. I continually am waiting for the wheels to fall off this Texans bandwagon. So this is the chance. I'm going with the Colts again, um, or as well. If for nothing else, I do. I just I trust luck down the stretch. If this is a close game, as I anticipate it to be, I anticipate a shootout, and luck has that knack for making things happen in the fourth quarter. Not that Watson doesn't, but luck's got this history of making plays down the stretch. I think he I think he pulls one out. Plus the road teams two and zero. I mean, you oh, know, of course, road that, team wins. That trend obviously that trend matters a lot. Yeah. All right, so the the next Saturday night game is Dallas and Seattle. Do you want to go to the, you want to go chronologically, or do you want to stay in the AFC? Chronologically, right? All right, so it's the Dallas Cowboys hosting the Seattle Seahawks Saturday night prime time. Got to put the Cowboys on in prime time. Yeah, of course. Um, it's a rematch that I almost don't even remember. They played earlier in the year. It feels like ages ago. Yeah, because early in the year, both teams where you know Dallas looked like their season was going nowhere Seattle was was a team that didn't necessarily have their identity yet and you know all these new players and what are they going to do with this run heavy attack so I don't even put much stock into the last matchup but both of these teams playing pretty well and Dallas's defense has been really good at home and I think that's you know that matchup Dallas's defense against Seattle's offense. Yeah, I mean Dallas period have been very good at home. They're 7 and 1 they at have. home this season yep. out of 10 wins. So yep. that's that's the thing that the Seahawks have to overcome here is the fact that this Dallas team has been pretty peerless at home. Um, and Seattle actually not as big a disparity as you would think for the Seahawks. You know, they typically have 
the most dominant home field advantage in the league. They're six and two, but they're four and four on the road. So they're five hundred team yeah. on the road, which isn't dramatically worse than their overall record anyway. Um, so I think they can show up and take a game to Dallas. But the question is, like, is it enough? Because this Dallas team at home has just been so dominant, particularly that defense, which is, I mean, it's been the thing that's carried this team's charge, but it's it's got that thing that all really good defenses have where they've got at least one really dominant player at every level. Yeah, I like so that. Yeah. Up front, you've got Demarcus Lawrence repeating his season from a year ago. Not quite as dominant, but still, you know, a primary pass rusher, an absolute ton of pressure. In the middle, they've got two of them. They've got Jalen Smith and rookie Leighton Van Der Esch. Those two have combined to be this incredible force. Dominant when it comes to flying to the football. Um, dominant at getting defensive stops. So they're not just getting to the ball. They're getting to the ball close to the line of scrimmage and stopping the offense for getting any kind of significant game. And then on the back end, you've got Byron Jones, who's this crazy story this year of a guy who wasn't even a cornerback a year ago. He was you know, drafted as this athletic freak safety type guy um or a team that or a guy that the team projected to a safety he became this sort of tight end eraser jack of all trades loved watching him and cover tight ends this year when they as they've pivoted to this kind of uh cover three cover one system they value cornerback length and that kind of profile more on the outside so they moved him back to cornerback where he's been spectacular yep he has and um yeah, I love, I love the Dallas defense and what they're able to do. And I think we remember the high-end games. You know, they shut down the New Orleans Saints. They did it on primetime. Everybody right. is remembering that. Um, so that's why you're looking at this game and you're like, all right, they've got a shot against Seattle. I think the interesting thing about this one with Seattle's offense is, despite having Russell Wilson, who's a consistent top five, six, eight quarterback, year in, year out, they went super run heavy this this year. The highest percentage of runs on first down, highest percentage of runs on second down. In theory, it sounds like a terrible strategy. I'm not saying that it's been proven correct, but they are. there are some games where it's worked for them. You know, They had a Detroit game where they ran the ball something like 45 times and threw the ball 17 times. There is this perfect game flow where they run the ball a million times and only run, you know, pass the ball off play action and it works. Um, it's a little risky because you're putting the ball into your running back's hands so much but they're number three in the nfl they're all their running backs yards after contact the offensive line has improved so they've gone run heavy despite having an elite quarterback who you know when (laughs) when they're in a hole or whatever you could bail them out because but even though they should probably put the ball in wilson's hands more yeah it's worked so far this year it has um i just want to make one more point about byron jones because byron jones has no interceptions this year which he's still grading people well. will look at and say, well, how can he be a good cornerback then? Because interceptions are everything. I noticed that yesterday when we put him on our all-pro team, and I, you like to just show all the good. He's got this many interceptions right. and pass breakups. It's nice to show, but the fact that he's grading that well without them. Yeah, and the point is that his role within that defense is a ton of press man coverage, right? right? Which means he's got... He's up in the receiver's grill. He's turning away from the quarterback to match the receiver most of the time. Those guys just don't get interceptions. They don't get a lot of them because they're not looking at the ball. That's what made Darrell Rivas so special. Right. They're looking at the receiver. They're, they're They're tracking the guy they're trying to cover. They're not really worrying about the ball until the last minute when it arrives. And then they're just trying to break it up more than they are pick it off. So the fact that he has zero interceptions... Is not a massive deal. He has nine pass breakups, which is four more than anybody else in that secondary. Um, his numbers have been pretty impressive, just a little bit over 50% in terms of completion percentage allowed. Um, so don't be swayed by the fact that he only has, or he doesn't have any interceptions because well, the way he plays the game within that defense is not designed to generate those interceptions. And he shouldn't be punished for that, essentially. In what you described is what generally happens with man coverage corners. They allow a lower completion percentage. They don't pick off as many passes. Right. If you're a zone player, you give up more yards, you probably pick off more passes. So there's some boom or bust there. Um, so Byron Jones, when Tyler Lockett's on the outside, Tyler Lockett having one of the most efficient statistical seasons we've ever seen for a, a receiver. A perfect passer rating when Russell Wilson targeted him this year, 158.3. And then the return of Doug Baldwin over the last few weeks. I mean, so that was... My preseason analysis on this is you have a banged up Doug Baldwin, you've got Tyler Lockett and a bunch of no-names at receiver, 
and you have an offensive coordinator who promises to run the ball down your throat. This looked like a formula for just disaster for the Seattle offense, but Wilson's played really well outside of a couple games and really a couple throws, and Tyler Lockett stepped up and been exceptional, and then you know, you've got uh, you know, David Moore you know, making big plays. It's, oh, did I just forget his first name? No, David Moore. Right? Oh, my God. I screwed up for a second. It's okay. Let me just check here. You look for it. Let me you check we're both right. But Moore's made on. a bunch of plays down the field, and then Doug Baldwin comes back, and yeah. he's great. It's David Moore. It's David you Moore. nailed it. My fault. But he was making a... Moore stepped up, made a ton of big plays down, down the field this year, and then with Baldwin back, you move him. He's in the slot quite a bit. Now they've got some tough matchups with these little receivers. Yeah, I mean... Uh, it was And more. <laughs> it was uh, Mike Renner, right, that made the point that the Seahawks offense the the way they've approached receiver i think is the template for the future right yep. everyone's there was a time in the nfl where everybody was looking for these six foot three 220 pound monster wide receivers who could just go up and make all the plays i think now we're starting to understand that actually the guys you want to be finding are the guys that just get open and you know maybe they won't win a jump ball 40 yards down the field all the time but if they're open, it doesn't matter. So Sometimes got, simple. You go, back, you go back to the simplicity. Separation is king. Getting right. open is king. So you've got Tyler Lockett, right, who is smaller than me. Tyler Lockett is 5'10", 182. Now, okay, he's got me by a few pounds, but I've got an inch in height over him. So mm. we're good, right? He's got you he's basically by my size. Skill. Shh. Sorry. Basically my size, right? That is not the typical NFL wide receiver profile. And you would expect that he can't, you know, go up and make all these plays. But he's open so much of the time that he doesn't need to go and win a jump ball against a six foot two cornerback because he's beaten him for two yards of separation off the line of scrimmage. So the Seahawks have got Tyler Lockett. You've got Doug Baldwin, who has one of the two best releases off the line in the NFL. I would say Adam Thielen has the other one. Those two guys win right away. So consequently, they're, they're wide open for Russell Wilson regularly. And it's, I think it really is setting the template. It's what we said for the, with that Panthers offense for years. Is that it's taken them yeah, get, three, get guys that four get years to figure out that if we just get a guy that gets open, it's actually better than if we just get huge people or guys with giant catch radiuses or whatever. It sounds so simple. But um, because we chart open throws versus tight window throws. Russell Wilson, number four passer rating in the NFL on open throws at 125. And PFF grades right up there as well. He's number five on open throws. So it sounds simple. Just get open. But Tyler Lockett does it. Doug Baldwin does it. David Moore's done it. So they've done uh, a pretty good job with the Seattle passing. The other thing is these guys that excel through being shifty and quick and winning at the line – if there is a weakness of those longer, stronger, um, physical cornerbacks like Byron Jones, it's dealing with people like oh, yeah. that. Like yep. the um, Richard Sherman and um, Brandon Browner back in the, the original Legion of Boom days. Right. They struggled the most going up against smaller, shiftier receivers. Like yep. those are the guys that gave them the biggest problems. Um, so it'll be, that'll be a fascinating matchup to watch is how Byron Jones does against those guys if he can't get hands on them immediately at the line if he's going to be struggling for living with them in terms of quickness. So the Seattle passing attack against this Dallas back seven plus Demarcus Lawrence rushing the passer, big matchup. The Seattle run game, as much as we like to dismiss run games because they're so dedicated to it, Chris Carson is running extremely well. He's graded well for us because the offensive line has been okay, not great. He's creating a ton of yards after contact. He's running really hard all every time. It does feel like every guy they could put up there in Seattle yeah. is just running hard. They just run with some tenacity. So I'm going to love watching them against Jalen Smith and Leighton Vander Esch. You said they fly around the field. They make a ton of plays. Leighton Vander Esch, top five in the NFL in defensive stops. Jalen Smith has that burst back. So as much as we like to talk about the passing game, I'm going to be watching the run game and watching these linebackers fill in against these Seattle running backs. These two teams are placed next to each other in terms of overall PFF grade. Ooh, graded yeah. as a team so 87.0 for the seahawks and 86.9 for the pretty close C, uh, what are those for, ranks? for dallas Eighth and nine they're actually no they're middle of the pack oh, okay strangely yeah. a but lower they are but they're neck and neck right they're separated yep. by 0.1 of a grading point all right let's go to the other side of the ball you've got uh dak prescott and the dallas cowboys you've got zeke elliott amari cooper it looks like the cowboys might have their triplets back they love having triplets, triplets. at all times 
That's what they do. That's how they build it in Dallas. You got to have the triplets against the Seattle defense, which you know has has played some really good games at home, and then they've been a little touch and go on the road. They're they're more the Seattle's team has always been been interesting for a few years because they're they're more likely. Like Russell Wilson's great at home, but they're more likely to play a defensive struggle at home, I think. And then on the road, they get into these <coughs> shootout situations. Not all the time, but you, you see that a little bit. Yeah, I think Not that's... like in the playoffs when they won 10-9 against Minnesota, <laughs> but... Yeah, no, I think that's true. It, particularly, you know, you go on the road to Dallas in a dome, so it's not like they're going to be dealing with adverse conditions mm-hmm. that's going to slow them down. This, They're a fascinating team because they are capable of doing both, right? They're, they're capable of being this run-first offense that just grinds teams down, but they're also capable of abandoning that entirely putting the ball on russell wilson's hands and letting him make crazy things happen right a bit like deshaun watson he's well well capable of doing that um it's going to be a case of how successful that is going up against this dallas defense though i think we're going to learn early so there's two things to look at i think i'm going back to the seattle offense because you mentioned russell wilson but um we've talked about the time the games where he's pressured over 40 45 percent of the time disastrous things happen as well as russell wilson plays under pressure yeah disastrous things happen also russell wilson you you could probably you could usually tell early if he has it or not and we were just talking about this in the office the other day about the volatility of quarterbacks at a game level sometimes russell wilson has three or four games a year where he's just really not that good and then three or four games where you're like this is the best quarterback in the nfl top one top two quarterback in the nfl you might be able to tell early if russell wilson's on or not but if dallas makes him feel uncomfortable early I think Seattle could be in trouble. Sorry, go back back into the to the Dallas offense. Dak Prescott has not played great. He's had some. He was he was really good last Sunday uh, against the Giants. That's a whole different animal. Why was he playing? That whole discussion. But uh, overall, he's the guy that's kind of put up some better stats than the grades would show over the last few weeks. Yeah, um, I'm kind of fascinated. So we talked about New Hopkins having this one freaky statistic: the drop rate. His probably got the best hands in the league because he just doesn't drop passes anymore bobby wagner is the defensive equivalent bobby wagner doesn't miss tackles yeah it's almost ever um so he has four missed tackles over the past two seasons now that's a game for some linebackers it it is a game for some linebackers and it's it's a good number in and of itself for a season like if a linebacker missed four tackles on the season it would be a pretty good year but it's even better than that because the three missed tackles that he missed a year ago all came in the final couple of weeks of the season where he was playing through a busted shoulder. So he, was, he went basically the entire year without missing a tackle, then was forced to play hurt for a couple of weeks and missed three, I think, in the final three games with an injured shoulder. Then this year, he didn't miss a single tackle until week 16 against the Chiefs. It's crazy. So basically you're talking about a guy who has one missed tackle while playing healthy over two years, which is a completely <laughs> absurd number. He's our highest graded linebacker um like number both, one in coverage number two against the run both the dallas linebackers who have played fantastically i think are in double digits for missed tackles yeah and they're not you know that's so luke keekley is at nine luke keekley is and he's one machine. of the best tacklers yeah the jalen smith yeah. is at 12 van der esch is at 13 so most linebackers are into double digits wagner's missed one wagner earned first team uh first team all pro for us at pff only one missed tackle on 138 attempts this year. As I mentioned, number one in coverage, number two run defense, also has seven pass breakups, has not allowed a touchdown in coverage either. Joe Schobert, who graded well, missed 24 tackles this yeah, season. 24? Yeah. Love Joe. Got to cut down on those. Cut down on a few of those. Think where the grade goes. Uh, let's discuss Amari Cooper really quick because, you know, he was written off pretty much in Oakland. People, I think people laughed at this trade, right? Yeah. They laughed at the Amari well, Cooper yeah, trade. Yeah, they laughed at the first round. The first round pick, right? Yeah, it was, I don't think that was crazy because you, I know you have to pay him, so you're buy, you're paying a first rounder, but he's still a first round caliber wide receiver. Well, now, apparently, but I don't know that you. I think the point was I don't know that you could have guaranteed that from at the point they traded him, right? It's not like you know Derek Carr has had his struggles, but it's not like he's a disaster at quarterback. You're not saying you're well, not looking at this guy and saying he's a hundred percent held back by the fact that he has no quarterback throwing him the ball like he's well, a first round is rich because you're assuming he's going to be in the open market soon right right yeah either way is this a number one wide receiver since yes coming over yes well i'm going to read some numbers to you oh, and okay you can say yes. fine okay 
He's 10th in targets with 72. He's averaged 2.15 yards per route. That's an excellent number. He's had a passer rating of 121.5 when targeted and a PFF grade of 82.5. Now, is that a number one wide receiver? Yes. Yes, it is, Steve. So they've got a number one wide receiver. And they've got Zeke Elliott in the backfield. So as much as we talk about the past games and, you know, Cooper's going to be a key here and um, he needs to get open for Dak. He's, he's top 10 in the NFL. I just tweeted it yesterday. Top 10 in the NFL in targets when open against single coverage. You got all those parameters? Yeah. Because we track, is it single coverage? Is it hole in zone? I think this is a telling stat because it's all your best route runners at the top. It's Adam Thielen. It's Keenan Allen, Devontae Adams. Cooper's at the top. So he can beat man coverage. But now you've got two teams that want to run the ball. Dallas wants to run the ball with Zeke. Seattle wants to run the ball. So maybe it's not going to be a shootout. Maybe that's actually going to condense condense the game a little bit. Yeah, the yards per route run stat, I think, is a key one for Cooper. Um, There's 15 guys in the league this year over two. So anything over two is a very good number. The league leader is Julio Jones, which is usually the case at 2.9. But the second guy... Yeah, the second guy is Michael Thomas at 2.66. So... You know, Cooper's right up there amongst the very elite guys. And these top guys are exactly who you would think they would be. It's Julio Jones, Michael Thomas, T.Y. Hill, and Tyreek Hill, New Hopkins, Keenan Allen. It's, you know, there's, it's the cream of the wide receiver group up there in terms of production. So Cooper has been up with that group since he moved over to Dallas. All right. So I, I love the matchup overall. Uh, Dallas has the weapons, I think, now, or a weapon, to maybe get into the shootout situation if they need to. But I'm taking Seattle because... Even though both teams, I think there's going to be a feel-out process. They're all going to try to establish the run. At some point, they unleash the quarterbacks. We get into more of a shootout situation. And I like Russell. I'm taking both road teams here on Saturday. That's Uh crazy. I I like Russell Wilson in the shootout situation. He's got the highest percentage of big-time throws in the NFL this week. I think that's that's what he does. I am going to go with Dallas because they're at home, and therefore that will win them the game. But do you want to know something that could be a pretty significant uh, swing, momentum swing within the game? What's that? Fumbles, right? Zeke Elliott has six fumbles on his carries this season, which is double any other running back in the NFL. Dak Prescott has four fumbles rushing this season, which is... He's got way more just in the pocket, though. Right, and plus... We've charged him for the most sacks of anybody, which leads to strip sacks, which leads to fumbles in the passing game. So this is a team that will put the ball on the ground a lot. Just those two, just on running plays, 10 fumbles. You know how many they've lost? I don't know. That's luck, though. Right. Three? Two. Two. Yeah, that's luck. So at the moment, they've only lost 20% of the balls they put on the ground. If that swings back to the Seahawks within this game... I mean, that could be huge. Let me add to it because I'm looking at Dak's passing numbers. He has a 74.6 overall PFF grade. Okay, where does that rank overall? 74.6 is only 19th in the NFL. Right behind Marcus Mariota, right ahead of Nick Foles and Derek Carr. The Carr family going to tweet me about that one too. Um, So he's 19th. Is that what I said? Uh, Sure. If if you sort by fumble grade, which essentially says, look, if you get if you get strip sack in the motion and it's really on the blocking, we're not really going to dock you for that. But when you have a bad ball security and you're trying to scramble and you fumble and you see a guy's coming after you and you still try to get rid of it and you fumble and it's a really bad decision, we're going to give you a really bad grade. So the fumble grade sorts through that third worst fumble grade in the NFL is Dak Prescott, 28.8. So, again, if you guys have PFF elite, if you guys are using pff numbers and you say well Dak has a 96.9 passer rating that's very good it's well above average why is his grade only a 74.6 sometimes you go to the fumble grade and you're like all right that's tying it together so the worst fumble grade in the nfl is cody kessler then lamar jackson who we'll talk about in a minute then Dak prescott 28.8 so something to keep an eye right so i'm just saying there's there's a there's not an insignificant chance that the dallas cowboys put the ball on the ground and so far they've been really lucky when that's happened yeah, Dak, uh, the sack thing has been huge, too. Right. He's definitely he's been doing the spin-out move where he's you know losing yardage and stuff, so keep an eye on Dak in his pocket presence in this one. I'm taking Seattle. You're taking Dallas. Let's get to Sunday's action now. Yeah, you're right. We're not, we don't go quickly through this at all. No. It's all right. We're just trying to, bring, trying to bring some depth to everybody. We're halfway home, Sam. Yeah. Halfway home. Los Angeles Chargers traveling to the Baltimore Ravens. The poor Chargers have to play at 10 a.m in a cross-country battle that is significant it's not i mean 10 a.m it's not that early after traveling across the country we'll travel across the country you know early it's a significant aspect for a while 
So on, it's on like paper, it's not like they're playing at six in the morning. Like ten a.m. is plenty of time to get your ass up, have breakfast, chill for a bit, and get on the field. Okay. Anyway, we're two weeks removed from Baltimore crushing the Chargers on the road, and we know how much home and road really matters in the NFL. It's about a six-point swing, you know, when you when you switch venues, right? Because it's three points for the home team, yeah, in in Vegas terms. So the fact that the Ravens just recently went to Los Angeles, they uh, uh, Philip Rivers had a pass rating of 51.7 in that game. That was the lowest he's had all season. Baltimore's defense is just playing really good football right now, even though Baker Mayfield put some points on the board there. He did have three picks, but he put some points on the board against them. This looks like, I mean, this should be the Ravens at home, right? Well, I think... It comes down to two things. One, how much pressure the Ravens are going to get on Phillip Rivers this time because that really was the thing that decided the game last time. They got an absolute 55% ton of pressure of dropbacks, which meant that the Chargers scored 10 points. The other aspect is the Chargers are one of a few teams now that have had a shot at Lamar Jackson twice or will have had a shot at yeah, Lamar Jackson a good one. twice. Yeah. And I have been making the point to some pushback on social media that Lamar Jackson right now is not winning games because he's very good. He's winning games because he is presenting a novel offense and something different that teams are not used to defending. And this is not like you're this, it's because you just can't get over because you just you live in <clears throat> black and white terms of good and bad. This is not exactly a controversial statement it's not like it's the first time this has ever happened right when a new quarterback comes along that is stylistically different from other quarterbacks they typically have a lot more success than they should right away right or then their play level dictates then the nfl figures out how to defend them and suddenly those guys start playing worse and we talk about sophomore slumps and what happened to x and well, define, why is tim tebow playing baseball whoa. instead of football right now like so this lamar's is gonna be playing happens. baseball in a few years that's not what i'm saying I know. what i'm saying is that tim tebow came along won a lot of games because he presented something completely different to nfl defenses and it took them a while to figure out how to deal with that can we once they did it turns out tim tebow's not a very good player and he couldn't make it in the nfl what we've been saying all along is that Lamar Jackson is going to survive or fail based on how good the passing part of his game is, which right now is his weakness. It right? absolutely is. It's by far, it's, he's definitely a below average passer. Right. So, so let's go back. We've said this a million times. Let's go back. And our pre draft analysis on Lamar, I think, is spot on right now, right? You put him in a run heavy scheme with designed runs, he's exceptional. He's an incredible runner of the football. He has 130 designed runs. That's the most ever. It's the most we've tracked since 2006. It's definitely the most ever since like the 40s, right? right? That's it. 130, 562 yards on design runs, 45 first downs or touchdowns. He does have 12 fumbles. We'll talk about that in a minute. Exceptional runner. He's a below average passer from an accuracy standpoint, yet he's also capable of doing NFL things in the pocket. He surveys the field. He dropped in that beautiful pass to Mark Andrews a couple of weeks ago against the Chargers. He can make big time throws but he's going to miss more than everyone else in the NFL. Yeah. That's where he is right now. So, yeah. So the, the fact that he's capable of making those big time throws is a big mitigating factor in his favor in terms of the passing. Yes, he's averaging like 150 yards passing a game, which is a terrible number in today's NFL, even offset with the rushing success. But he's capable of making those big throws. And honestly, one of those big throws was the difference in the game the first time they played. He hit, was it Mark Andrews down yeah, the, the middle Mark on Andrews a perfect pass. play? And that honestly was the difference between the two teams on that day. So he's capable of being the difference from a passing point of view, but most of the time he's missing too many of those plays. But I think crit I think it is critical. The Chargers are the first team that's going to get two cracks at Lamar Jackson, right? Yeah. And what I've been the point I've been making is that eventually teams figure out how to defend these guys that present a unique offense to a defense. And obviously, the more times you see it, the more times or the longer, the more opportunity you have to figure out how to stop it. Now, it's not like it was a runaway success the first time these two teams played. The Ravens scored 22 points overall, and really that one play was the difference. One big play in that game, uh, a catch and run to Mark Andrews over the middle, was basically right. the, that was the majority of the output. He passed for 204 yards on 12 completions, and one of them was, what, 60-something yards um, to Mark Andrews? So... 
that's a big thing. It's not like this was uh, at, at 68 yards was that play. It's not like this was a runaway success the first time around and the Chargers have had a look at it already. So I think the two things are, will the Ravens get that level of pressure on Phillip Rivers again, and therefore will the Chargers be kept to 10 points again, and will the Chargers defense have figured out Lamar Jackson? No, I think it's fair. I think it's a fair point. Um, Lamar Jackson, because people have cited completion percentage for Lamar as well. He's at 58.2. That's 36th in the NFL right now. Yes, it's above Sam Darnold, Josh Rosen, and Josh Allen, by the way, the other rookies. I think my issue... Who have, who have been bad. Yes, they have not played well at right. all. Largely. What I'm saying about Lamar, though, and what we said in our pre-draft analysis as well, he's, he's below those guys in ball location accuracy, below Josh Allen as well. He's worst in the NFL, as in... And we saw it in the, Chief, in the Chargers game, too. He's got a wide-open receiver, and he puts it on his kneecaps for a completion. Right? right, so because of Lamar's running ability, and the fact that defenses have to account for him, and they run more play action, he will have more open throws. Pretty so much. So that's how you get to the higher completion yeah. percentage. Just let me finish my my thoughts, Sam. I got this. No matter what way you slice it, Lamar Jackson is an inaccurate quarterback at a macro level. That should not be a controversial a controversial statement. And if we can't make it without. <laughs> getting into an argument, we probably can't talk. Well, this is where you've had issues with, um, you know, Panthers fans. Right. So Lamar Jackson, Cam's right now, game. he is, the is it the lowest completion percentage in the NFL, just raw completion percentage, or the second lowest, did you Lamar? say? Lamar? Yeah. He's, he's second lowest in adjusted completion percentage. He's yes. lowest in our accuracy. So lowest data. in accuracy percentage, one of the lowest in he's straight completion, in percentage, completion percentage, and 37th in adjusted completion percentage. So no matter what way you slice it, he is a fundamentally inaccurate quarterback that is capable of making spectacularly accurate passes. That's, that's the key, right? And, and that, I think, differentiates him from some of these other fundamentally inaccurate quarterbacks we've seen over the years. Guys that just aren't accurate enough to play we're not really capable of those spectacular plays. But Lamar is, and that's what makes him a really intriguing guy as a passer, is that I don't think what we get now is what he is going forward, necessarily. He can make spectacular plays. He does a lot of quarterback things in terms of going through reads, finding the right guy, and identifying where to put the ball. He just misses too many throws. But the question is, can he get good enough at the first two parts of that to offset the last part? Can you make enough good plays and can you be good enough in terms of identifying where to go with the ball that it doesn't matter that you will miss more throws than other people when you add in the fact that you can then be a rushing threat as well? I don't know the, the answer to that. I think that's what determines whether he'll succeed or fail. But right now, my basic point is he's a spectacular runner, spectacular athlete, is winning largely because he's presenting a novel offense to NFL defense. That he's also, but also, the one piece that you're missing here, he's very good at running this offense. Of course. He's very good at running. Right. All right. And this is where you're arguing with people because you said he's not good. And at, a ma- a at, good at an overall level, he's not a good quarterback. At what he's being asked to do, running the football, he's very good at it. Other than fumbling. And so this is where the PFF grade's not going to match up. And this is what, what I was going to come back down to. This game comes down to turnovers. And I know that's the generic. Nobody tuned into PFF to hear this game comes down to turnovers. But let me do it from a PFF standpoint. He has nine turnover-worthy plays against six big-time throws this year. Yeah. So as much as we say he can sit there and make big-time throws, capable of it, yes. Does he do it at a high level? No. Six, which, by the way, didn't Ryan Fitzpatrick have six in a game? Or was it five in a game? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he's, got, he's got not many. So that's not great. He doesn't have many. Um, but nine turnover-worthy throws, okay, plus 12 fumbles. Some of the fumbles on him, some of them not. But the fact that he's got the second lowest fumble grade, again, yeah. without even looking at the specifics on the fumbles, I know that we've downgraded him heavily mm-hmm. for those fumbles, a lot of them coming from the rushing attack. So while he's picked up 500-something yards, so let me ask you this. View it like this. If you were, He's got 560 rushing yards. He's probably opened up a big, you know, some big holes for Gus Edwards. Let's, let's pretend that Lamar is accountable for 1,000 rushing yards right now. Is that worth... 12 fumbles. Let's call it 10 fumbles. You know, if you were going to if you were going to have 1000 passing yards, right? If I told you you could you're going to have 1000 passing yards over 7 games, but you're going to have 10 turnover worthy plays to get those. Yeah. Right? That's a huge that's a high number. Yes. That's a risky number. Now those dr- passes could get inter- dropped as intercepted they could be intercepted, they could be dropped interceptions. His fumbles could be recovered by the Ravens, they could be but that's risky. And that's where we are with this whole thing. The rushing, the rushing 
is difficult to stop. Gus Edwards has been exceptional. It's a completely different offense. The fumbles are an issue. The turnover-worthy throws are an issue. He does have issues seeing underneath linebackers. Chargers play a lot of zone-heavy scheme. That's, I think, what's going to happen with this Ravens offense. I think that's going to be the key. Yeah. I mean, when you net everything out, they've obviously massively increased the amount they're rushing with Lamar Jackson at quarterback. They've catapulted that. You know, they're averaging 200-plus yards a game on the ground compared to like 100 when it was Joe Flacco at quarterback. Right. So they basically doubled their rushing output. On the other hand, they're averaging like 150 passing yards when he's the quarterback. So it's not like it's not like a giant output overall. Like it's gone up. They, I think they're averaging 19 yards more of total offense per game with Lamar in than they are uh, Joe Flacco. So the offense has basically got the same output. It's just a completely different style. Let's discuss the Baltimore defense a little bit because our numbers have them ninth or 10th in the NFL just from a pure grading standpoint. Our EPA numbers have them in the top five. They are one of the best defenses in the league. There's no doubt. And it still comes back back to, are they capable? Are they capable in a one game setting? And the way they stop the run up front, the way they've rushed the passer in recent weeks, you've got Terrell Suggs still going. Yeah. You have Zadarius Smith leading the team with 60 pressures and he really killed uh, the Chargers the last time around. He's an edge that essentially, he's a big edge that they've started to move in, in inside. Matthew Judon has 42. The big question mark coming into the season was Baltimore's ability to rush the passer because they've got a pretty nice little secondary. They have three guys with over 40 pressures. That's very significant. It is. Um, and it, it really comes down to how much they're going to get pressure on Phillip Rivers because those guys were destroyed, the Chargers' offensive line, the first time they played. And it hasn't gotten better since. I mean, right. they didn't have to pass much against the, the Denver Broncos, but Rivers was under pressure 11 plays and only had 13 without pressure. So they still had a pretty good day against the, the Chargers' offensive line. They, I mean, I said before, they kind of reminded me a little bit of the Minnesota Vikings in terms of a team who is whose offensive line woes is going to come back to haunt them at the worst time, like in the playoffs where you go right. up against the best defensive fronts and they're just not good enough to keep their head above water in those games. And, you know, Phillip Rivers, as spectacular as he's played this year, again, you reach that point where it's just critical mass and he can't play given that, lev- that volume of pressure. The Ravens were at were ahead of that level the last time they played, and I don't know what the Chargers could do between then and now to change that. And Rivers has uh, struggled a little bit down the stretch. Um, definitely statistically, the grades haven't been as bad as the stats have shown, but he's got uh, multiple interceptions in, in a couple games now. Uh, three straight games. Six interceptions out of his 12 over the last three weeks. Not all on him, but we have seen a few more of those YOLO balls, you know, just chuck it up. And that's that was the, those were the games that we said Philip Rivers hasn't had yet. He has been remarkably consistent. His lowest game grade was week 11 against Denver at home, 64.6. His lowest game grade at, at 64 is really good. And, of course, he's got a bunch in the 80s and 90s. Does he revert back to, you know, he, there's always one or two games a year where he's three picks, four picks that are on him that are just terrible. He has that in him you know potentially too especially when under pressure that's the thing i think he might but if it if he does it's going to be it's going to be entirely down to um the volume of pressure that comes on him like his his pass rating under pressure this season was absurd for a lot of the year yeah um he was up that's come down almost 20 points over the past few weeks again just because we've reached this level this threshold mark which beyond which there is no coming back from you can't play in the face of that level of pressure and I just for the Chargers, I think this game almost comes down to what have they figured out in terms of doing since that happened to stop that happening again on both sides of the ball. Yeah. What have but, they what have they figured? But out? I think even even if they do exactly the same job against Lamar as they did last yeah, time, true. I think they've got a shot if they figured out a way to take that pressure rating down 15 percent. If they haven't, they just can't win. I mean, literally, they can't win this game unless they figured out a way of mitigating that hunter henry key to the game right yeah. finally he's hmm. gonna play some snaps he is he's gonna play a little bit hunter henry perhaps the key to the game i mean Stephen um, a smith had that weeks ago he did we're way behind um in my in our official picks i think i took the chargers okay i don't feel great about it <laughs> but i took the chargers where'd you go with it ravens you're taking the ravens yep the lamar train all right 
One left. Even though you're a hater. One left. We're flying through this thing. Oh, yeah. The Philadelphia Eagles fighting Nick Foles against the Chicago Bears. This is where Bear, Bears fans tune in and love us on YouTube and on the podcast. You know, I haven't checked our uh, breakdown yet, but I'm assuming we still have all of our Chicago listeners. Oh, of course. Yeah. Still our number How's, two city. The, I have to check. Probably not. The best defense in the league, the Chicago Bears, taking on... Nick Foles. If Nick Foles is going to pull this one off again, he's got to go through the best defense in the league. Yeah. In the Bears. Yeah. The, the Foles thing is fascinating because, well, one, the prospect that he could actually repeat this ridiculous run that he had that went from being essentially an afterthought comedy backup quarterback to actually he just had probably the two greatest postseason games ever and won a Super Bowl. Uh, the idea that he could potentially repeat that is insane. Uh, the idea they're even in the postseason, given what needed to happen for them to make it, is pretty crazy. What if he goes on a four-game stretch here? Right. But what's really fascinating is that he hasn't come close to the level he played at in the NFC Championship game or the Super Bowl. Those two games were like way in the 90s. They were basically as good as you're going to play. And so far, he's been pretty good, but he's been grading in the 70s, like right. consistently in the 70s, which is actually remarkable for Nick Foles, to whom consistency is not a friend. But it's because we've talked before about how you can get anything out of Nick Foles from amazing to terrible, and you don't really know where it's going to land. At the moment, it's landed pretty consistently just north of average into reasonably good territory, which means that there's a ton of extra room to get better. Like, we could see this Nick Foles spectacular play come again, but obviously there's the looming specter of we could get this train wreck. So let's do it from a number standpoint, okay? Um, and we mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but Nick Foles playing really well under pressure. Uh, 90.6 passer rating under pressure so far this year. In his limited sample, that's number one in the NFL, just ahead of Deshaun Watson and ahead of Dak Prescott, guys that are playing this weekend. And again, if you guys have been listening to us, you know, hey, that, that fluctuates, right? That's volatile. Here's the on-field reason why it's volatile and why it fluctuates. Um, I usually I call it the Josh McCown factor. Okay. The Josh McCown obliviousness, the, uh, the obliviousness quotient is what I like to say, in, the, in right. the pocket. Josh McCown, obliviousness quotient. In 2013, Josh McCown steps in there for the Bears, and he was making ridiculous throws in the pocket, under pressure for the Bears. The Bucks go and sign him that offseason. They're like, oh, Josh McCown, he's going to be our guy. And he went from the best quarterback, or one of the best, under pressure, to the worst. And he was doing the same thing. So the same throw where you're like, man, great job, stood, you know, looked down the barrel and made this great throw and he took a hit and he dropped a dime in there. You're like, hey, great throw. It's, it's not because he was tough or whatever. He just didn't feel where the pressure was coming from and every now and again it works. And then you do the same exact thing and you're like, how did you not feel that pressure? And you make the same throw and th this time you're just a little off and it's intercepted. That's why pressure fluctuates. It's because you sit there and there are certain guys who just don't feel pressure that well and it works for them on some throws, and it works completely against them on other throws, and the result is essentially, you know, random. That is Nick Foles so far this year. Yeah. If you look at some of the throws he's made, especially like in the fourth quarter, you're like, how did he get that ball down the field to Alshon Jeffrey? How did he do that? And the results have been, you know, absolutely fantastic. 66% of complete, uh, he's completing 66% of his passes under pressure, and a lot of them are down the field. That's, that's crazy talk. Yeah, and his downfield passing has been really impressive. Uh, he's got a pass rating of 103 on deep passes down the field. The one thing I think that he is really good at is being prepared to heave the ball down the field knowing he is about to get murdered by somebody running right at him at he, full tilt. Oh, he is. To I, the point where... Some of those plays were, have been really good. To the point where he did it against the Rams, and you're like, I mean, that's Aaron Donald. If there's one guy that you might want to go, you know what, it's not worth it. I'm bailing yeah. on this one. It's Aaron Donald. Yeah. So I mean that, but so that's where he's really good, and he's got he's got some strength and he's got some arm strength to get the ball down the field. But I think this game comes down to on this side of the ball at least when he's pressured, when Khalil Mack gets there, he's got 69 pressures, he's healthy. When Akeem Hicks gets there, when those guys get pressure, does he stand in the face of it and does the throw get to his receiver? Or does the throw land in Roquan Smith's hands? Or does it end, yeah. land in Eddie Jackson's hands? Does it land in the defense's hands? I mean, I think that's the, the thing here is that I, 
the Eagles' offensive line, I think, might hold their own against Chicago's defensive front. As much as you've got Akeem Hicks, who wrecked the Vikings, you've got Khalil Mack, who can wreck anybody. The Eagles' O-line is still pretty good and might, I think, do a decent job. The problem is is that over the past few weeks, Foles has been heaving these balls to Alshon Jeffrey, has been wide open or dominating smaller guys. The Bears actually have some legit coverage on the back end. So, By the way, I know not, Eddie Jackson's banged up and potentially might not play. Right. So this isn't going to be, you know, free passes down the field the way it has been right. necessarily over the past few weeks. They're going to actually have to beat some relatively impressive coverage to get those opportunities and if you're throwing it downfield just into a contested situation, I think they're going to be more contested or more fiercely contested than they have been in recent times. That could be the problem that derails this Philadelphia offense. So, yeah, they're, they're banking on some Foles magic. Alshon Jeffrey has been fantastic for him uh, down the stretch. Uh, anything else on this Bears defense? I mean, Akeem Hicks, it's funny, every time we put up an all-pro team, you know, everybody gets in there with their favorite player and you know, this guy was snubbed. And we've seen some Akeem Hicks snub talk, and it's like, well, you have Aaron Donald and Fletcher Cox, and we'll talk about Fletcher Cox right. in a minute. I mean, those guys are the clear top two guys, but Akeem Hicks and Chris Jones from the Chiefs, I mean, they're in that next tier of just awesome this year, so they deserve credit. I mean, Akeem Hicks, Hicks has been a better player than a lot of uh, all-pro players, just not at his position. Yes. His problem oh, yeah, is just that's two fair. better guys. Yeah, no, that's fair. So Akeem Hicks exceptional year for him we know Khalil Mack coming off the edge and you know as we look back at the 2018 season um, our free agent analysis on the Bears was you know they really should just try to bring the secondary back right Prince of Mukamara yeah Fuller you know Adrian Amos back there I mean we were like hey if you just bring the band back together they'll be pretty good and that's essentially what's happened. Yeah. Um, this is the only game of the weekend that isn't a rematch of some kind over this season. Interesting. That's a shame. That would have been a nice symmetry. It would every, have been. every game is a rematch. It would have been. But I do have to say, I love a good, you good know, rematch. cold weather playoff game in Chicago. Yeah. I do love that. You know, I hope it snows. I hope it snows too. I always like snow games. Foles in the snow. Anybody like, in the snow. Snow games are yeah, quality. I don't, I'm not going to listen to any, anybody who whinges about the impact it has on the football. Snow games are just better, period. All right, I'm with you. The end. All right, let's go to the other side of the ball. Um, the Eagles' defensive line, we have some numbers. Still the best in the NFL. By far. Yeah. As far uh, as getting They have goes. 37 more total pressures than any other team in the league. They have the best win percentage, the best pressure rate, the best pass rushing productivity score. They are the best pass rushing unit in the NFL, despite Brandon Graham only getting five sacks on the year. Why are you going to bring that up? Because uh, you lost the bet. It's and like I fifth did. in total pressures or something, too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my, my favorite was what happened when the chips were down. You know, Last the, the game is on the line. Steve needs Brandon Graham to actually convert some of these pressures into sacks. And over the last two weeks, Brandon Graham got, uh, what are we talking here? 14, 15, 17 total pressures and zero sacks. <laughs> <laughs> he is actually, so he's, he has one more pressure than Khalil Mack. <laughs> Granted, he's done it on a few more rushes. But the point is he's got 70 pressures. Yeah. Only five of which are sacks. Right. That is one of the lowest conversion rates you'll ever see. <laughs> which is why I bet that he would have five more sacks. I bet a lunch. You did. You did. The problem is he's always like that, and you probably should have seen that coming. Except last year. He bucked the right. trend in one year, and then they win the Super Bowl. How many total pressures bucked. did you say he had? 70. Five divided by 70. Yeah, so yeah. actually that is pretty much his career baseline. It's seven. It's a, it's a conversion rate of 7.1%, and I think when I ran this before, before last season, his kind of baseline for his career was like 8%. The, so it's slightly worse in his baseline. And his baseline is way below the average of like Oh, yeah, his baseline is like right? half of the average. 15, is I think, it 15? for edge rushes. Which is why I was banking on, you know, there's no way this right. is that big of a trend with him. I'm banking on him reverting back yeah. to the average But my time. point was that that's his career baseline. That's probably where he's going to end up. And it turns out not only did he end up around there, he ended up the other side of it. Well, because so he's getting Good pressure, work, Brandon. Thank that you. allows guys like Michael Bennett to get sacks, Fletcher Cox to get sacks. That's what's happening. Yeah. So the Eagles... Fletcher so, Cox is number two in the NFL in total pressures. That, I mean, if it wasn't for Aaron Donald again, that would be insane. 
The yes. interior guys do not get pressure at the same rate as edge guys. He has 17 it. more pressures than the next closest guy. So it's Aaron Donald with 106. Fletcher Cox with 95. They're both interior players. This, this number is supposed to be led by edge defenders. The first edge defender is D Ford with 78 and J.J. Watt with 75. Right. This is a 310-pound guy getting a what should be a league-leading number of total pressures. Only Aaron Donald is there as well. Yep. So Fletcher Cox... Um, He's got the second highest grade among all defensive linemen. Of course, he's three points below Aaron Donald, but um, pretty significant. Um, 92.6 grade for Fletcher Cox. By the way, Akeem Hicks, 91.7, our number four graded defensive interior player. And Hicks has 51 total pressures. So it's going to be this Eagles defensive line. Chicago offensive line's done a good job. And the, the story we've mentioned all year is that the scheme in Chicago has been fantastic. Mitch Trubisky's overall stats have been pretty good he's running the ball extremely well we trash Trubisky that's all we do but most importantly he is playing well over these last few weeks and he's throwing the ball much better and taking care of it much better yeah although every single one of these games seems to come with at least one clanking play that you know torpedoes is great so it's like we would be grading him really well only he keeps making one play a game that's like oh stop yeah. it Bad interception, fumble. Yeah, a couple and so weeks many ago. times they don't show up in the box yeah. score. So it's like a negated, terrible interception. But it does go back to what we said earlier in the year. If he does start playing better, yeah. and making throws beyond the sticks, you know, and, and moving the chains and all these different things that he's doing outside of the scheme, it makes them very dangerous because they've got Tariq Cohen, who has been as valuable as any running back in the NFL. It's pretty much him and Saquon Barkley from just a pure value standpoint. They move them all over the place. You have Allen Robinson who can make those contested catches. You have Trey Burton. Again, our preseason analysis, offseason analysis is all of these weapons merging together lead, could potentially lead to a pretty good offense, and that's what we've had in Chicago. Yeah, they're still one of the highest teams in the NFL in terms of RPO usage, those run pass options. So this is one of the hardest offenses in the National Football League to defend because they show you everything. Right. And there's so much to have to deal with. They can run the ball up the middle with – Jordan Howard, the way they did with the Vikings, just grind them out. They can hit Tariq Cohen on the edge. They can pass the ball to Tariq Cohen, give you matchup problems with him. You have to cover a legit number one in Allen Robinson. You have to deal with these RPOs, the fact that they show you three different things to have to defend at any one time. This is just a really hard offensive system to shut down because you have to cover so many different things all at once, and there aren't that many defenses that can do that. Yeah, so... I think what I'm looking at here, though, is the way Trubisky plays under pressure. Because a lot of times when he faces pressure, I, I feel like a lot of quarterbacks are doing this. Deshaun Watson does it sometimes. Russell Wilson does it sometimes. You're taught not to drop your eyes, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of quarterbacks who are playing right now, and Trubisky does this. He drops his eyes, and he says, okay, let me navigate the rush first. I'm going to navigate the rush first, get out of the pocket. And then when he gets out of the pocket, sometimes he's looking to throw. He's probably not looking to throw as much as a Russell Wilson or a Deshaun Watson, but he'll run. And he's got 29 first downs picked up with his legs. He's third in the league with 421 yards as a scrambler behind Josh Allen and Deshaun Watson. So I'm curious to see is when he faces pressure, is he going to try to navigate the pocket, get outside, or is he going to make throws in the face of pressure because his PFF grade drops about 25 points as a passer when he's facing pressure? Yeah, how much pressure the Eagles defensive front can actually get on him is a big thing. And then how well their coverage holds up on the back end is, I think, the thing that's been defining their entire season is everybody got hurt and they were forced way deep into the bench and guys that had no business starting were being put out there and getting just destroyed. Um, and it was going extremely ugly. So two things have happened. One the guys that were hurt have started to come back and actually obviously improve the talent level. Two, the guys that were thrown into the fire have started to be tempered a little bit. Those guys have actually been you know, forged by the fire that they were thrown into and have become better players because of the beating they took. Right. You know, this idea that you only get better by playing people better than you. Well, those guys have been playing people better than them all th through the season, Maybe so they've gotten worked. a lot better. Yeah. Um, so... The Eagles, deep, the coverage is much better now than it was earlier in the season. And I don't know if it's good enough to be able to overcome all these things, but it's at least got to the point where it shouldn't be, you know, eviscerated. And the reason they're losing games immediately right off the bat. That's fair. So can the Eagles secondary hold up? Yeah. Is the big question. Uh, where are you going with this one? 
Uh, Chicago, home team. You've got. I've only Sh- taken one road team, I think. Yeah, I'm taking Chicago as well. I yeah. just, I do, I do think that defense uh, slows down the Foles train too much. You know, they're, they're just too much. They make things difficult. Um, makes for some really, really great divisional matchups as well if they have to travel. If, they, if Chicago wins, they definitely play the Los Angeles Rams. That's, that's the one matchup that's locked in. If the Bears win, that's who they play. If the Eagles win, they definitely play the Saints. But Bears Rams rematch, but in Los Angeles could be a really good one. Not that I'm looking ahead. We take it one game at a time here. Okay. Okay. All right. We're taking the Bears, the Trubisky train. We're riding it. How about that, Bears fans? <laughs> riding the Trubisky train at least for one more week. So there you have it. That's it, man. It only took us four hours to yeah. get through Rapid the fire. wild card preview. Of course, if you guys want all these numbers that we have, it's all a part of PFF Elite Premium Stats. 2.0 which technically we don't talk about our job titles here often sam but that's kind of like your your baby now you're kind of in charge of uh yeah but it can't be my title because otherwise my visa expires <laughs> i hope the visa people aren't <laughs> listening we, you didn't change your job you have the same title right correct yes you have the same title uh-huh okay but you've got more on your plate, so to speak. Yeah. So I'm not allowed to change my job title, otherwise they, they I have to change they my ship visa. you off. Right. Pretty much. I gotta see if we could. <laughs> if there's one way, if you piss me off, man, I'm gonna get you out of here. Sorry, I'm working on the green card. I'm Hopefully gonna create a new title for the you. Green card will trump that. Then I can change job title willy nilly. I'm gonna weekly. Get, in fact, I want to promote you to CEO. Well, you can just do so that. You get yeah. smoked. Uh huh. So you're out of here. <laughs> Once I get the green card, I'm just going to change my title on a weekly basis. You don't want to be the sultan of premium stats? You can't be that either? Not yet, no. Green card, then I can get that. Then you could start changing your title. Yeah. All right, so go check out premium stats, which is um, just something else that Sam does right now under his current title so that he doesn't get deported. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. We'll be back again Monday. We'll recap, recap all of the wild card stuff and start looking ahead to divisional round. Everybody enjoy all of the football this weekend.